Today we're talking about a foundational model in natural language processing, the hidden Markov model, HMM for short. While the HMM can be used for many different tasks, we're going to use part of speech tagging as a motivating task. So if you need a refresher on what part of speech tagging is or what a part of speech is, check out the video linked in the description. A hidden Markov model is a finite state machine. What's different is that instead of a deterministic process, we apply a probabilistic Markov assumption. The hidden Markov model moves from state to state probabilistically depending on the previous state and nothing else. And those states correspond to the parts of speech. In the end, this actually looks like a language model in that it can generate sequences of text, but it does this via the hidden states. So now hopefully you can understand the name hidden in that you don't know what the parts of speech are, they're unobserved. Markov, you transition from the current state to the next state and model, it's a model for generating text. And all of these components are defined probabilistically. We'll make this more formal in just a second. If you have hidden states, you have probabilities for moving between the hidden states. Once you are in a state, you emit a word from that state. And this just keeps going until you've generated your text. Here's a cartoon example that I adapted from Ray Mooney. Most finite state definitions assume a start state, so we'll do that too. But we'll also need some other states. We'll add more in a bit, but let's add determiner and proper nouns for the moment. Although we start in the start state, we need to move somewhere else. So how does that happen? Let's say that we have a 0.4 probability of going to a determiner state and a 0.2 probability of going to a proper noun. I'll write that as a number on the line connecting two states to each other. Once we get to the determiner, we can go uh, somewhere else. We can't go back to start, but a determiner can go to a proper noun. Think about the Maryland. Now you'll notice that the numbers don't add up to one. That's because I've left out some of the states. I could have also made some mistakes. Let's add some more states to the diagram. First up, normal nouns. You can start a sentence with a noun. So we'll need a transition from the start state to the noun state. At this point, you get the idea. So let's add another part of speech verbs and a few more transitions. There are different schools of thoughts on how to handle when you stop generating words. I normally just have a start state and the parts of speech, but to show you how some other people do it, you could also have a stop state with explicit transitions into it. Once you reach that stop state, you stop generating. The transition probabilities are the probability of going to another state given the current state that you're in. Again, it only depends on the current state. That's the Markov assumption. So once you're in the verb state, you can forget about exactly how you got there. Unless I screwed something up, let me know in the comments if I did. All of the edges coming out of a state should add up to one. And hopefully you can see how to go from state to state. Start and start. Pick a next state, rinse and repeat. One thing that's completely possible and that I haven't done in the interest of keeping things neat is to have a self loop. You can of course remain in a state. This would make sense for instance if we had a state for adverbs or something like that. Okay, but this is not the complete story. We also need to generate some words to go along with these parts of speech. Each state has a distribution over words. So once we're in the determiner state, there are only a couple of determiners you can use. This is called a closed class part of speech. It's going to be a, the, or maybe an. Once we're in the proper noun state, we're more likely to generate words like Tom, Tia, Tahir, Tin, or Tabari. Those classes, verbs, nouns, proper nouns, are open class parts of speech. Unlike other finite state machines that you might have seen with an accept state, we assume that any string that we can generate is a part of our language. The difference is that some strings have higher probability than others. So the string Tom kick the ball takes this path associated with transition probabilities 0.2, 0 0.65, 0 0.4, and 0.05. I'm leaving out the emission probabilities for the moment. Run Tom the shot would have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, which is much, much lower. To get the emission probabilities in there, let's go through this 
a little bit more formally. Assume that you have k parts of speech and a dictionary lexicon of size v. And you have some observations x1 to xn. The x's are your words, and to go along with every word, you have a series of unobserved states z1 through zn. These are your parts of speech. We assume that we have a distribution over start state, and this is a vector of length k, that tells us what is the probability of having i as our first part of speech in the sentence. We also have a transition matrix that tells us what is the probability if you're in state i at time n minus 1 that you'll be in state j at time n. We also have an emission matrix beta that tells you what is the probability of emitting a particular word w given that you're in state j. So all of these things together define a joint probability distribution over a sequence of part of speech tag z and observations x. A good exercise would be to practice computing the probability of a sequence, like what I just sketched out before, without the emission probability. But you should do it again with the emission probability. And that's it! That's the definition of a hidden Markov model. But before we go further in the next video, I want to remind you a little bit about the properties of a hidden Markov model now that you know what it is. First, it should be clear that this is a generative model. You can generate text from a hidden Markov model that looks like some kind of English, but that doesn't mean it's a good language model. Its job is not to generate the most fluent, coherent text. That's more of a job for a real language model. Thus, you should probably not use perplexity to evaluate a hidden Markov model. And if you look at the sketches of modern methods, what the models look like, they have the same general form, words connected to hidden representations. If you don't draw arrows and don't explain what the boxes mean, an RNN looks identical to a hidden Markov model. A transformer has a bunch more hidden stuff going on and more lines connecting it up, but nevertheless you have the same nodes aligning to words, and the stuff on top represents some sort of hidden representation of the words. How all of this happens mathematically is quite different. Most Prominently, hidden Markov models have discrete hidden states, and we'll start talking soon about how the continuous vector hidden states for RNNs and transformers are the current state of the art. But that doesn't mean that hidden Markov models are no longer useful. They are! They're useful for determining the part of speech of a word in a context, particularly when you don't have a lot of training data. And as we'll see, it's quite easy to estimate a hidden Markov model from data. And that intuition will be valuable when you or your data outgrow hidden Markov models. This is just one video from a course that I'm teaching. If you want to get the whole context, check out the course webpage linked below. There you can find all of the videos in the right order. YouTube likes to show you older videos out of order, homeworks, exercises, and recommended readings. And if you want to help other people find videos like this, please be sure to like and subscribe to provide a big gradient to the algorithm.